So we're on O4C aeronautical charge, but this we'll call this part two if we want to. Peters and projection, we did that one. See, I remember being on this slide and talking about this slide. But I'll look at the video in any case. Uh, but this is why we use con conformal conic projections. Sorry. Is because straight lines. You know what? I have this vivid, vivid memory of drawing a straight line, of drawing a straight line from San Francisco to Ireland and flying over Greenland. But I could be wrong. It'll only be my fourth time today I'm wrong. So we're going to be using that kind of a projection on our charts. So I do have one more chart. I want one kind of, pro not really a projection. I'm just putting this up because it's really fun. And my whole life, until about uh, 10 years ago, I thought Greenland was as big as Africa. Because I kept looking at Mercator projection charts. I literally thought Greenland was as big as Africa. And then I look at the Peterson projection. And now granted, the, the countries near the North Pole and near the South Pole are distorted. But the size, the area, is correct. So if you look at Greenland versus Africa, Africa is four, five, six times bigger. But I still had a misconception about how big Africa was until I saw this. And I've double-checked. This is correct. If you take the 48 states of the United States and turn it sideways and shove it down in there, you can also see, uh, I like this one because they put Mexico in it. This is the, one, I, the other one. Here's Mexico. Here's China upside down. Here's Western Europe. Here's Eastern Europe. Here's uh, Spain and Portugal. Here's Japan. And here's India. Holy mackerel. Remember, the United States, from here to here, that's about 3,000 statute miles, which means from here to there is about 5,500 statute miles. And from here to here is about 4,500 statute miles. So literally, Africa is three or four times bigger than the 48 states. So when somebody says that there's 50 plus countries in Africa, it makes sense because Africa is huge. Okay, I'm not going to ask you any questions about Africa on the test. Now I'm going to ask you questions about VFR aeronautical charts. There are two basic types of VFR aeronautical charts. And we're still taking notes off of a piece of paper I gave out last time. You need a piece of paper? You got a dollar? Sorry. I don't want the dollar. I just want to know if you have a dollar. You do? Okay. Okay. I'm just dropping paper left and right. Airport lighting. Well, I'm sorry, Jordan. I don't seem to have, didn't seem to have brought any of the pages from last time with me. It's good. You know, if, you, if you'd have given me that dollar, it would have been a different story. So you're going to actually have to write things down. So here's what I want you to write down about sectional charts. The scale, S-E-A-L-E, -E, the scale is one to one to a half of a million. One to 500,000. So that means half a million miles will a mile, a whole mile on this chart. Of course, neither the earth is not a half a million miles, and the chart is not a mile. And I'm not going to ask you that one inch equals approximately seven nautical miles, but this scale is rather important because you'll notice, look how many different sectional charts you have to have to cover just the 40 states. And you need to understand also, you don't have to write this, but these sectional charts, half of it, 
as on one side and half of it on the other. So if we look at a chart that's got the Fre it's, it's got Fresno in it, the other half of it, and it goes up not quite to Sacramento, the other half of it has Sacramento and Lake Tahoe and stuff on it. So these combined are the San Francisco sectional. So this, both sides of this, equals just one of those rectangles up there. And when I say scale, question? When I say scale is one to a half of a million, that means that this is 500,000 times smaller than real life. So if we made this chart 500,000 times bigger than a, a mile in be a mile in real life. So it's, that's really small, right? Okay, good. I'm glad somebody agrees with me. Yep. Then there's another chart. It's called a WAC, or a World Aeronautical Chart. A WAC. Yeah, now WAC, when you, when you hit something, that's W-H-A-C-K. Just so you know, this, this is WAC for World Aeronautical Chart. A World Aeronautical Chart looks almost identical. Put on a piece of paper. It looks nearly identical to a chart. And this looks a whole lot smaller. That is, the world is smaller. I actually have one here that's got this on it. But you know what? I put a picture in here. So how many whack charts, if we don't count uh, Cuba and the Dominican Republic, there's not even half as many whack charts as there are sectional charts. So here, just for fun, here's what, we used to, we're, what we're used to looking at. We've looked at these charts before. And so there's the Fresno Air Terminal. There's Class C airspace, those two magenta rings about it, around it. But if I take a picture of a WAC chart, everything is half, a si half the size. That is, it shrunk. It shrunk. So the scale of world aeronautical charts or WAC charts is one to one million. Jonathan. WAC charts and sectional charts are for the same purpose. It's for visual navigation. Oh, that one, that CF-19, that's telling you this chart that this got scanned off of is that one. So that's what it would show on the front of the chart. So if you wanted to fly in Maine or Nova Scotia, I'm not, I'm not sure what, what's the... Is anybody familiar with Canadian provinces? I'm happy I know where Maine is. Yeah. Do Canadians speak French? Some Canadians speak French, just like some uh, people in the United States speak Spanish. There are places in the eastern part of Canada where more French is spoken than English. In fact, I have a friend of mine uh, who I didn't meet until after he retired from the Canadian Air Force, and he didn't learn to speak English until he was 18 years old. And he went off, he went to the Canadian Air Force Academy. And he had to learn to speak English. But while he was going to school, he also learned Latin in addition to French. So now he's trilingual, although I don't think he speaks Latin a lot. So somebody always asks me, well, Mr. Johnson, why do we have sectional charts and aeronautical charts? Sectional charts are for slow airplanes, and wax are for faster airplanes. So if I'm flying an airplane, VFR, and that airplane goes 200 miles an hour, then I'll cover the same chart length on a WAC as an airplane that's going 100 miles an hour would do on a sectional. Me personally, I'm used to flying airplanes around at 90 knots which is a little more than 100 miles an hour. So I generally don't flock WAC charts because there is one big difference, uh, another big difference. WAC charts don't have as much detail on them. So you can write that down. WAC charts have less detail or less details because there's not as much space for it all to fit.
Hallelujah. Is it Christmas season already? today. I have a sectional for every human except for me. But most of my students think I'm any human. So. so what I'd like you to do, let's open it up to Fresno and Reedley and Selma. We got a 50-50 shot of opening it up on the correct side. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at a couple of airports. I'd like you to find, actually, you know what, let's have more, let's look up on the San Francisco side. So flip it over. See if you can find San Francisco International. I'll give you a hint. It's in San Francisco Bay. So San Francisco International has four runways. Two next to each other, going kind of north and south, and then two going kind of east and west. So it looks like it's a plus sign, except it's got two sets of runways. In fact, you'll see some big blue circles around it. So if you turn to the San Francisco side, you got to go all the way over to the ocean. So side, you know what? That is Fresno. Okay, my apologies. I told you to flip it over. My apologies. It's on the same side as Fresno. But go all the way over to the ocean. It's tested. Look at all that yellow stuff. Huh? There are a lot of flights out of San Francisco International and Oakland International. And Jose. San Jose. So, San Francisco, I'll give you a hint here. San Francisco is in the middle of those blue circles. Jordan, flip, flip it over. It's on the inside is right now. There you go. All right. So, anybody not have the blue circles? Okay. So, if you look right smack in the middle, you'll notice there's a blue, there, it's blue, and blue means what? That it has a control tower. Now, that doesn't mean the control tower operates 24 hours a day, but it does mean it does have a control tower. If you'll notice uh, down a little bit, magenta, it's in a circle. When they runway is more than 8,069 feet, as will fit in a round circle, if it's a bit longer than 8,069, then they just draw the airport like San Francisco International. We've already covered the fact that it's a star that that there's a rotating beacon. On that magenta airport, you know, on the top, bottom, left, and right, those, those little tiny stars, I had forgotten what those meant. Those mean that fuel is normally available during at least business hours. And you're looking at squares at San Francisco International. Sure, they have fuel during normal San Francisco. And the answer is yes, but it's expected if it's that big, there's probably, you probably are going to know that there's going to be fuel there. Question? There's four of them. Top, bottom, left, and right. Okay. Let's see. Um, see if you can find an airport that has a car in it. One on the, there's one on the... Yeah, in any case, find one that says R. There's one to the left of San Francisco International, and there's also one... Line about halfway down. There's a round circle with an R in it. The R is restricted. Not that you can't land there in an emergency. It's just that you 
you had an engine failure and you landed there, you'd be fine. So it doesn't mean that you can't land there. It's just that you can't land there either without prior permission or you can only land there if it's an emergency. If you have to land at a military airport, they will drop up to you in trucks with machine guns, and they will impound I don't know if they will arrest you, take you into custody, and they will search you, and they will search your airplane, and they will ask you many, many questions, and it may take days for you to get out. What's that? Well, I would call them up. I call the Mortal Evil Air Station. This is... Uh, 3435 Juliet, Mayday, 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 an engine failure, I'm in the morning fire station. Would you please clear traffic out of the way, because I'm landing on your runway. Dude. And then you say dude at the end, with an accent. Dude. You got to look at the really long. Dude, dude. And then they, they'd say, yo, 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 go ahead and land, that's fine. They're still going to put you in custody, and they're still going to pull out machine guns and point them at you. And the U.S. military is looking at their runways that aren't supposed to be there. They don't like it. They won't shoot you, but they won't like it. They will drive up with guns and machine guns. Relax, relax. They're 18, 19-year-old kids that have been trained how to use machine guns. And they never, never get to shoot them at anyone, and they're very frustrated. And they come up going, oh, I wish I could shoot somebody. Air Force, and we were on nuclear alert. They would drive around the alert pad with pickup trucks with 50 caliber. Weapons, you person has to be there with So if they drive by and they see you next to the airplane and they can't see the other person, they will drive up will say, lie down, spread eagle on the ground, right now, and they will scream at you. And if you don't lie down, spread eagle on the ground, by the end of their second request, they get to shoot you. Even if it's snowing and there's two feet of snow, lie down, spread eagle on the thing. 50, yeah, 50 caliber machine guns, the big ones. 50 caliber, that's a half of an inch, yeah, a hole in me would be about this big in, in the back. <laughs> It would not be pretty. So they said, these are the 18 year old kids, the airplane mechanic, and they made them be security policemen in North Dakota, outside, and they never get to shoot anybody. So they're, if, they, if, if, if you're not spread eagled on the ground, by the time they have finished saying out loud their second request, they're going to shoot you. I think they were lying to us. I think you actually got to three, but they told us to get down on the ground. So I made sure I was anywhere around the weapons and everything. That way, that like that getting jacked up? You didn't want to get jacked up. All right, so I want you to uh, look at San Francisco International and go about an inch and a half north of there, and you'll see a round uh, cir circle, a round circle, a circle that is round. There's an X in it. Can anybody guess what that X, that circle X? Airport, or it's closed. I'll bet you ten bucks if you overflew it. They have X's painted on the runways. They're not putting it there because they think it's going to be a good idea to land there. They're putting it there as a so if you were navigating by looking out the window. Yeah, that's called pilotage. But I want you to write this down in your notes. Pilotage. I'll spell it here for you. Pilotage is when you're looking out the window and you're seeing landmarks to navigate. You're navigating by vi looking out the window and finding landmarks. And you don't have to write this down, but landmarks could be man-made, like buildings or roads or streets or, or airports. They could also be uh, natural landmarks, like a lake or a river or a mountain peak. 
So when people first learned how to fly, remember the olden days in aviation history, people were trying to fly across the country to an airmail, and there were no navigation transmitters, and there was nobody to talk to on the radio in either. They Yeah, hit the ocean and turn left. When you hit the green, you make a left. Okay. Military. So let's see. Can we find a military airport here? Airport looks like. If it's round and it's small, there's two circles on it. See, if it's round and it's small, it looks like this. But what if the military airport has a runway longer than 8,069 feet? Really, if the runway is longer than 8,069 feet, the only way you can tell if it's a military airport is at the label. Alameda Naval Air Station there. There's Oakland, and there's Hayward, and maybe Alameda is not there anymore. Okay. Maybe it's not there. All right, fine. Let's see if I care. So let's see if we can find, find anything interesting about airports. What's that? That is a map. Yes, have a good time. So you'll notice this thing on the screen here over on the right. This is the legend. And it's on everybody's sectional. If you folded it up, you would find that it tells you what all the answers are. When you go take the FA written test, they give you the legend. So if they ask you about an airport, you can look at it. Of course, you're going to be so proficient by the time you get there. You won't need to look it up. Okay, now I want to talk about uh, two kind of navigation aids. Let's see, we're looking at... Well, let's go to Fresno because it's a lot less clutter. Now, what up? Yeah, they also see FAT. All right, so here I'm going to show you on the screen because I can. So you'll notice that there's a symbol here, there's a, a block, and it says Clovis, and it says 112.5 in it. So that's the navigation transmitter frequency that it's transmitting on. That's a little bit above 108 at 108 FM. So the name of that is Clovis. You'll also notice that there's a three-digit identifier, CZQ. And then you'll notice that there's some dots and dashes right there. And that's actually the Morse code for this transmitter. If you're in the airplane and you want to navigate this transmitter, you turn it at frequency, 112.5, and then you turn up the volume, and you can hear that Morse code that's right there, that uh, Dash dot dash dot dot dash dash dot 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 dash dash dot dash. That's three letters. That's CZQ. That transmission of those that code is tell you pilot that trans is working correctly. If there's something wrong with this transmitter, they will turn that code off. And they have to be working on it, fix it, and still transmit. But they'll turn off the Morse code while they're working on it. And 
it's not working correctly. So every time you go to use this navigation transmitter, you crank in 112.5, and then you turn the volume up on the navigation radio, not the communication radio that you talk on, but the navigation radio, and you listen for that, and then you turn it back down. Do it anymore. Now you'll notice that around that transmitter is what's called a compass rose. So I'm going to draw it up here on the screen. So here's this giant compass rose. And you'll notice it points an arrow at zero. And every 10 degrees. Now sometimes they don't mark them all because there's things in the way. But this goes all the way around. And there's 360 degrees, just like on a compass. And this correlates to the directional gyro, or that heading indicator, in the airplane. Let's say, for instance, that I take off out of Reedley Airport, and I want to fly to Madeira Airport. One way to do that is for me to get out a straight edge and draw a straight line from Reedley Airport straight into where that VOR transmitter is. And then I'm going to look on this compass rose and see if I was flying in the airplane, what direction would I have to head to get to this VOR transmitter. And it's difficult on here. Can anybody tell me which one of these lines it is? Let's see. If that's 12, that's 11, 5. Is that the 110? Okay, but now let's look at this for a second. I know this is difficult. If we're going to fly from Reedley to this VOR transmitter, is our compass in the aircraft, is our heading indicator going to read 110 degrees? What's that? No? What's it going to read? Well, let's assume there's 10 degrees to the right. No, let's pretend there's no wind. Okay, let me give you a hint. If you're flying, remember, it, around here we're at 13 degrees easterly variation. So if I'm off by 13 degrees, if here's true north, magnetic north is off by 13 degrees. Look at this needle right here. I bet it's off pretty darn close to 13 degrees. So this compass rose is lined up with magnetic north not with true north. So if I was at this transmitter and I was flying outbound, oops, and I was flying outbound in this direction, my compass would read 110. But I'm going from the airport in the opposite direction. I'm going in the opposite direction. So what would my compass read? The opposite of 110. So here's a, here, if here's 110, you want to add or you want to add 100 or subtract 180. So if I subtracted 180, I'd come up with a negative number. So I'd want to add 180. Another way to do that is add 200. That makes it easy, 310. And then subtract 20. That makes it 290. Because it's easier to add 20 and subtract, add 200 and subtract 20 than it is to subtract 180. So the answer is, I would be heading 290 on a compass. And if there was no wind, I would fly right to that transmitter. Then if I wanted to fly directly to Madeira, what does that intersect? It's hard for me to see on this picture. I can't see all the numbers. Can anybody tell which one that is? It's probably about 280? 285? Okay, we'll call it 285. So what you need to get at this moment, which is not too much, is if you want to fly somewhere, as long as you can fly to one of these navigation transmitters, it's called a VOR, you can then fly.
away from it directly to anywhere you want. It doesn't have to be an airport. It could be out in the middle of nowhere if you wanted, but usually we don't fly out in the middle of nowhere. So what do you have to know about a VOR? A VOR is a navigation transmitter. It's a navigation transmitter, and it's they're bolted down to the ground, and they're aligned with the magnetic north. So it's a navigation transmitter. They're bolted on the ground. And I say that because they're not like GPS that are up in space. And the third thing is they're lined up where they're aligned with magnetic north. And you find these on sectional charts and Navigation transmitter, it's bolted to the ground, and it's lined up with magnetic north. So the next thing I want to talk about is DME. And DME is a transmitter that's usually located in the same place as the VOR, but it lets tells your airplane how far away from it you are. So for instance, if I measured this distance from the VOR to Madeira, and I'm making up a number, and let's just say that it's 17 nautical miles, if I was right overhead a Madeira airport and I had my DME on, it would tell me that I was 17 miles away from that VOR. So if I hit the VOR and I was flying away from it, it would say 5 miles and then 10 miles and then 15 miles. Well, of course, when I got to 15 miles, I'd know that the airport was only 2 miles ahead of me. So DME stands for Distance Measuring Equipment. And DMEs are usually at the same place as a VOR. And that's a really good one there. VOR stands for... VOR is very tricky. V stands for very high frequency. Very high frequency, omnidirectional range. Sorry, my handwriting is pretty lousy right there. This is an I. That's omni. Omnidirectional range. Yeah, it wasn't my idea. Why didn't they call it VHFODR? How about... How about 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 how FSS is an abbreviation for Flight Service Station. And the Flight Service Station are the people you call and talk to and ask them about the weather. You can call them on a telephone before you take off, and you can call them and talk to them on the radio after you're airborne.
So you'll notice this box right here, there's an example box right here. This is, this is the Oakdale VOR. You notice there's these frequencies on top. Those frequencies are how you could talk to the flight service station. So these up here are the flight service station frequencies. So if you're near this VOR, you can try them on these frequencies. So let's see, just for fun, what's the flight service station? Is there a flight service station frequency associated with Clovis VOR? No, there isn't. But look, look down here at Visalia on your chart. Look at Visalia. You see how it says 122.1, and then there's a capital letter R? Capital letter R, receive, means that you can transmit to them and they receive on 122.1 and they would transmit back to you on the VOR frequency which if I say you is 109.4 so if you wanted to talk to the flight service station I sell you you would turn VOR to 109.4 and then turn up your navigation radio sound volume control and you turn the communications radio to 122.1. Is that what it is? 122.1. And you'll notice underneath the box it says Rancho Murrieta. That's the name of the flight service station. So you would say it like this. You'd say Rancho Murrieta Radio, because they're not a tower. They're not a departure or an approach control. We use the term radio. Rancho Murrieta Radio. Um, where are we? Tomahawk 3435 Juliet transmitting on 122.1 and receive 109.4. And so there's somebody sitting at a radio twiddling their thumbs, eating a turkey sandwich and a pickle. I think it's a sweet pickle, it's not a dill pickle. And they're just sitting there waiting for somebody to call them up on the radio. Now 109.4 already got their radio set and they're going to come back and they're going to say Tomahawk 3435 Juliet this is Rancho Murrieta what's up I mean they're going to say okay they're probably not going to do that but they're, they're, they're going to say okay I'm glad you're having a good time there Rodrigo uh, they're going to say you know they're going to they're going to say go ahead and you're going to say, I'm landing at Reedley Airport. What's the, what's the weather at Reedley? It's Oscar Airport Oscar 32, or I'm landing at Visalia, or I, what's the altimeter setting? You could call them up and get the because your flight say you're flying from Los Angeles all the way to Sacramento, and you got to have your altimeter set within something that's within 100 miles of where you are. You could call up flight service and say, wherever you are, I'm over Bakersfield. What's the do you have the the altimeter setting for Bakersfield and for Fresno? And they'd say, stand by, and they'd look it up, and they'd say, 3435 Juliet, altimeter setting for Bakersfield is 29.97, and for Fresno is 29.99. Anything else? Because that pickle is getting cold. I mean, it's getting hot. And you're going to say, no, that's all I needed, thanks. And then they'll start crunching on their pickle and finishing their turkey sandwich. Unless, unless they leave a key on. <laughs> That Rancho Murrieta Radio, 3435, Juliet. Uh, I can hear you eating that. That's never happened. I've never heard of an air traffic controller. I've never heard an air traffic controller eating a pickle. No, no, they're really good at laughing at you after they let go of the mic. Because it's all recorded. But it doesn't record what they're saying when it's not pushed down. So they all know that. Because as soon as they hit the microphone, it transmits anything that comes across that frequency. So as soon as they let go, it doesn't get recorded, and they can laugh at you, and no one will know. But they're all air traffic controllers. All right. You know what? I think we've had enough for one day. So would you fold up your charts and put them on that table? And that clock is actually... Uh, no, the clock's actually correct.